Hey guys, welcome back to Ranger Survival and Fieldcraft. I'm Andrew, and what I have for you today is solo overnight bushcraft camping style with our bushcraft and survival kit. Nothing fancy, but we're going to spend a night in the field and then pack it up in the morning and head back to the ranch. Stand by. Now the beauty of bushcraft is that we can recreate just about everything we need from the landscape given just the essential items as part of our kit. You'll notice that we have G twine rope that we made with the help of a rope spinner from a previous video as the pack straps for our pack frame and everything is lashed inside of our pack frame that we do not need readily available. All the items we need readily available are going to be in our haversack as well as our firearm that we can carry and attempt to harvest game off the landscape. That haversack is going to contain our basic fire kit, water with our canteen, as well as some cordage and other items that we need. And everything else that we don't need right away is either in that pack frame or inside of our tarp or attached to the outside, just like our large tools, the axe, the saw, even the bush knife or parang that we can grab very easily and harvest materials without digging into that pack frame, leaving all the items inside until we actually need them for shelter, for cooking or for setting up our camp at night when we're ready to lay down and bed down. Let's take a look first at our haversack. The items we're going to need are readily available to grab and do whatever we need to out on the field. The first thing on top is just going to be a little bit of food stores that we bring out with us as part of our kit. And then we have our canteen, 40 ounces that we can drink from and stay hydrated, followed by our headlamps so we can see in the dark if the lights go out. And then we have just a basic sewing kit inside of a piece of bamboo with cork securing the ends. And then after that, we have just a few hanks of different cordage, paracord, as well as bank line, followed by a ditty bag that contains our fire kit so we can get a fire started without digging through our pack frame. That ditty bag is going to hold a lot of the smaller items we want to contain as part of our sub kit in our bushcraft camping kit. This ditty bag is for our fire kit. The first items on top are just going to be natural tinder sources, in this case horse hoof fungus that we can use as a tinder source to get a fire going out in the field. Next we have just a couple of candles that we can use. We can create a candle stick holder and light our camp at night. After those candles we have just a magnification lens wrapped up to protect it. That way we can use the sun's rays to harness the rays, ignite fine tinder material. We then have a piece of fat wood. Again, natural tinder material off the landscape. We can make shavings with this, use matches to ignite that fat wood and get a fire going. After that fat wood, we have a fire piston. A fire piston is more of a traditional form of starting fire with fine tinder material, especially char material. And we can use that to ignite that char and get a burst that's blown into flame. After that fire piston, we have a tin that has our char material in it already prepared as well as our flint and steel kit, a piece of high carbon steel and a hard rock, in this case a piece of chert, that drives sparks off that steel to ignite that tinder. And then we have a match safe made from a piece of bamboo as well as wine corks from the bottles to seal off the ends with jute twine to help seal the ends, keep it somewhat water resistant and house the matches that are part of that match safe kit that we have inside of our ditty bag. There's strike anywhere matches with a couple of strikers inside so we can use those to get a fire going. As you can see we have a variety of ways to start fire using natural material or using the sun's rays. The sun was out today as well as more expedient methods for getting a fire going with pre-made char material in that tin either with flint and steel or with a fire piston and we have a more modern tool which is the match. The match is still a traditional form of starting fire but we can make that match safe for materials around the area and then house those matches safely to travel with and take them to our camp. Another item in our haversack kit that is important is going to be a repair or sewing kit. There have been many times out in the field where I've blown out a pant leg or a crotch or torn a sleeve and had to pull out a sewing kit and repair it right on the spot with whatever means I had available. Having a sewing kit gives us the ability to actually repair clothing so we can continue movement and protect ourselves in inclement weather or colder climates. This sewing kit is housed inside another piece of bamboo with wine corks stopping the end and we have just a slip knot to prevent it from falling out. 
Once we remove that, we actually have a piece of cloth with all the needles and safety pins, and then even a bobby with thread wrapped around already on that thread to complete our kit. There's an easy method we can use to suspend our gear, not only our pack frame, but also our haversack off the ground to prevent it from getting wet or keep it up off the ground if it's been raining like it has today. We just take those two straps of the haversack, the left and right side, wrap it around the tree once. We put one strap under the other, find the loop, take a toggle, put it through the eye of that loop, and then draw it tight. And now our haversack is up off the ground and we can still get into it if we need to and get out items for everyday use. And then once we're done, we just pull the toggle, grab the haversack, and we're ready to go. The first tool on the outside of our pack frame is just a bush knife. It's still somewhat around the time of year where we can use a bush knife or a small parang easily enough to harvest still green material that hasn't died or hasn't become too hard from colder climates or from winter so we can use this to harvest material very easily next is just a small forest axe or hatchet this is a council tool woodcraft camp carver that we can take into the field gives us the ability not only to take down material but then because of the scanty grind and cutting surface we can use it to carve material as well as make clean cuts out in the field with a larger tool that last item on the outside of our pack frame is just a fold down buck saw this buck saw we can fold down collapse and place on the outside of our pack frame very easily it comes in its own holster and then we can draw it out when we need to it has a locking clamp by the handle so it is very secure as well as graduated marks so we can measure different material this is 21 inches and it is perfect for bushcraft because the items we're going to take out in the field don't need to be any larger than three to five inches in diameter and this saw is perfect for that we can fold it back up place it back in our pack frame very easily and move out now for the kit that we have on our belt, our main cutting blade or that belt knife is going to be the Pathfinder Scorpion Outfitters Edition. We got that Scandi grind, approximately five inches of cutting surface for carving and woodcraft as well as processing game in the field. 90 degree spine, high carbon steel. We can use this as a flint and steel kit as well as striking our ferro rod, full tang knife, curly maple birch handles would give us a good purchase on this knife for all the skills we're going to be doing out in the video today. We also have a multi-tool on our belt, Leatherman Rebar. This is the same thing as the Super Tool 300. It's only missing one screwdriver, and it's smaller and sleeker, easier to pack, and lighter weight. But this gives us all the same functions as the Super Tool 300. We have those needle nose pliers, wire cutters, we got our main blade, as well as a series of screwdrivers. Also, that reamer or awl, which is great for woodcraft out in the field. And then our file we can actually use to hone or sharpen up our tools as well as metal objects we find out in the field. We got that small saw that we can use for carving. That Phillips head screwdriver for manipulating man-made materials or whatever we need. Can opener, bottle opener combo, as well as just a serrated blade that we can use for another cutting device. This is a very small tool that fits right on our belt, lightweight, that we can use for a variety of things out in the field. Those needle nose pliers give us extra purchase power, meaning we can manipulate things out in the field as well as pick up hot objects like a hot bottle out of the fire if we're trying to purify or treat water to make it safe to drink. So a good tool to have out in the field. And then in our pockets for a pocket knife, carry is a Swiss Army Field Master. The only difference between this and the Huntsman is that this comes with just that Phillips head screwdriver instead of that corkscrew on the back of that Swiss Army knife. We still have that hook that we can use as a toggle, the reamer or the awl that we can use for woodcraft, very important tool. And then on the front, same as usual, is we're going to have that main blade, we're going to have that smaller blade, as well as a saw for finer notch carving or cutting. We also have Scissors. Scissors are incredibly important for a Swiss Army knife, in my opinion, because not only can we use this for sewing or for cutting different materials or clothing, we can use this for hygiene as well to clip our nails or our hair. And then we have the obligatory 
can opener, bottle opener, tools that we can use as screwdrivers as well as small pries. And then on the back, highly recommend we put just a length of cordage. This is just enough cordage and a Cobra braid that we can use this for a friction fire set bow drill. And then we have our mini tools, just those tweezers, again for hygiene, and that toothpick, again for hygiene that we can use out in the field. So we have not only a woodcraft tool, but a hygiene kit, as well as a possible fire starter right there in our pocket with this simple Swiss Army knife. We keep all these smaller cutting tools on our person because we have a wide variety of different options for cutting and harvesting material off the landscape. And these tools are gonna to be the ones that are most important around camp so we don't lose them, we keep them on us at all times. Now we went ahead and took our bush knife for our parang and harvested two bipods or four legs we're going to make into bipods and now we need to shape tent stakes just basic camp craft or bushcraft materials and tools that we're going to use to set up our shelter we're going to set up a double bipod lean to and we need tent stakes to stake out our double bipods with our quick deploy ridge line as well as our tarp to set up our camp for the night and shelter To construct our shelter tonight, we're going to need to create bipod legs. We're going to need two of them. We're going to do something called a shear lash. A shear lash is just taking two sticks and lashing them together with a series of wraps, followed by a series of fraps. To do this, we just find our cordage, grab one end, create a bite, hold both ends of the cordage, put our finger through the loop, spin the loop until it wraps over on itself a couple of times, and then we take that, wrap it around one of our bipod legs, pull the excess cordage through the loop we created, and now we have our timber hitch and we can begin wrapping around both bipod legs. We wrap around both bipod legs four to five times, typically starting at the bottom and working up. Once we get four or five wraps, now we can turn our bipod legs on their side spread the legs and then begin our fraps. Our fraps are going to go in between the bipod legs over top of our wraps and we're going to do this two to three or four times. Around each frap we're going to stop, grab our tent stake or our toggle, wrap it around the cordage and use that toggle to actually cinch down on those wraps with those fraps. That way we actually construct this and we have a stable structure that is not going to give out on us and we have that tension to create those bipod legs. Once we're done with that, we have two bipod legs ready to go for our shelter. A technique is to take our bipod legs and then measure out the distance we want to sleep or the sleeping area typically seven to eight paces, and then we lay down those bipod legs at each end. So we're satisfied with the distance in between our bipod legs. We can now hammer in our tent stakes. We do this approximately one full stride length away from where we expect our bipod legs to sit. We do this so we have an appropriate angle with our cordage that will prevent slipping our cordage off of our tent stake and then losing our entire structure, watching it fall over. Once we have those tent stakes in the ground, we grab our quick deploy ridge line. There is a end of the line bowline loop on one end of our quick deploy ridge line. We take that, put it right over top of our first tent stake. And then we grab our cordage and move to our first set of bipod legs. We pick up those bipod legs, spread them out, place them where we want them, and then we take that cordage. We go over top of the X and then underneath wrapping and coming back over the top one more time to create one full wrap around the X shape of our bipod legs. Once we have that complete, we maintain tension on the line and move to our second set of bipod legs. Once we get there, we stand those bipod legs up again, just like the first set, spread them out, take that cordage, once again, go over top, around, underneath, and then once more over top to complete one full wrap around the second set of bipod legs. Once we get there, now we can maintain tension on the line again and move to our stake or our second stake in the ground and now we can simply tie off the entire structure maintaining tension so that those both bipod legs are standing up ready for us to attach our tarp. To attach our cordage to our second stake, we're just gonna do a simple trucker's hitch, creating a loop in the standing end, 
biting it, pulling the loop through our loop we created from the standing end, slipping our running end through twice on that loop around our stake and then applying tension pulling down until everything is tight on that tent stake. Once enough tension is applied and the structure is standing freely without us holding the line, we can then take the excess cordage as part of our quick deploy ridge line, hank it up, and then put it through a loop we create, tightening down the loop to keep everything nice and clean around camp so we don't trip over it in the middle of the night. Now we're ready to hang our tarp using some toggles at the top two corners left and right. You'll notice that the tarp itself the length is actually longer than the actual length in between our bipod legs. There's an easy fix for this. Because we only went around the bipods once in one complete wrap with our quick deploy ridge line, all we have to do to create some slack is spread out the bipod legs a little bit and then feed the line over top of that single wrap until we get the bipod legs stretched out far enough to accommodate our tarp and then we can finish hanging our tarp. All that's left for us to do to complete our shelter is hammer in our tent stakes. We're going to go to the cloth grommets halfway down our tarp and we're going to use the excess material to wrap underneath of our sleeping area to give us a little bit of a pad to sleep on as well as stay clean or keep our blanket clean. So now all we do is just take those tent stakes, hammer them through with our maul and our shelter is almost complete. Once we're done with the tent stakes and we're satisfied with that, all we have to do now is take the excess tarp material and pull it back inside toward the area we're going to sleep. This extra tarp material is going to basically be a ground tarp that we can sleep on. And just to test it out and make sure we're all good, we're going to lay out our blanket and make sure it fits and everything looks just right for tonight's camp. Now we have rain inbound this afternoon, so one technique is to fold down our blanket and then roll our blanket up in the excess tarp material to keep it waterproof once the rain comes. We're going to use a simple pot hanger tonight to suspend our cooking pot above our fire in our nice little fire pit. And to do this we just need two fork sticks and then a horizontal crossbar. This one's a little longer than one you've seen in other videos. We just hammer the forks in the length of our fire pit and then we can place our cross beam on top of those forks to make sure everything fits just right. We're going to use a special technique in this video where we take a inverted Y and create a simple pot hanger or pot suspension for our one quart bush pot to hang over our fire and cook our meals. Now we're going to use an inverted pot hanger to hang our bush pot. We're going to take the Y of that stick and create a pot hanger out of that Y. To do this, we're going to shorten it to length to make sure it will fit over top of our fire pit and suspension. And then we're going to carve a pot hanger notch in the bottom portion of that stick because it's going to be upside down. To do this, we just take our knife and our maul and we hammer in an X at the place where we want that pot hanger notch to be. From there, we take our knife and we carve down toward the end away from the Y of our stick to create our pot hanger notch because it's going to be inverted. And now we just carve away material and continue to carve until we're satisfied that we have an appropriate pot hanger notch that is going to support our bushcraft bush pot and the bale wire because it is a large bale and sit comfortably over our fire to cook our food and boil our water. The beauty of this type of inverted pot hanger system is that we have the ability to not only simply place the pot over the fire safely while being able to manipulate or move that pot, but we can simply lift up on the pot hanger, that inverted Y, and slide it left and right down that horizontal beam to either move it into the fire or a better location over the fire, as well as to move it away from the fire to allow it to cool and then collect the material inside. With our pot hanger complete, now it's time to gather some water from the stream. I'm just going to go down to the creek over here and grab some water, fill up our bush pot, and then we're going to head back to camp, suspend it over our fire pit, and then get ready for the next phase of our camp setup, and that is actually creating fire and preparing food.
Since we have more traditional fire starting materials as part of our kit, preparation ahead of time with tinder material as well as fuel sources, kindling and fuel with our fire elements is going to be crucial. And so we have to actually take the time and pause and reflect, think about how we're gonna set up our fire. We have cottonwood bark that is somewhat dry, although there's been a lot of moisture in the air recently, but we can still use this with our more traditional methods to get a fire going fairly easily. To do this, we're gonna form our tinder bundle with that cottonwood bark. We're gonna have coarse material on the outside, medium material, and then we're gonna have very fine material within our tinder bundle. To do this, we just form the bird's nest itself and then grab the finer material, the choice material, grind that up and make it into somewhat of a powder exposing the surface area and place that right inside of our tinder bundle. We're gonna use our fire piston to get this fire going as well as the char from inside of our tin that is already pre-made. For this to work, we just grab a small piece of that char, put it in our fire piston plunger, and then put it in the actual piston itself or the chamber. We then just hammer down on that piston, remove it very quickly to expose that char to oxygen to allow it to actually combust. What's happening within the piston is that the space within the actual tube itself is collapsing at such a rapid rate that it is actually creating heat or enough heat to ignite that fine tinder material, much like the heat from a flint and steel kit, that fine spark that lands right on char material to ignite it. Once we have that char lit, all we have to do is take out our knife or we could take out a pocket knife or a stick, remove that char material from the end of our plunger into our bird's nest. You'll note that we have already another piece of char material inside of our bird's nest to help grow that ember and expand that ember because the material is somewhat compromised due to the moisture in the area with the rainfall recently, as well as with moisture and dew condensing in early morning hours, it's gonna compromise this tinder material. Once we have that char lit, it is just business as usual now. All we have to do is grab that whole tinder bundle of that bird's nest, cup it, and then slowly add oxygen, increasing the size of that ember from the initial fire piston char material to the other char material that's in our bird's nest. Continue adding oxygen until finally it bursts into flame. We place it in our fire pit and now we can begin adding smalls and our fuel source on top of that burning tinder bundle. And with our fire raging now, everything's set up in a sustainable and maintainable fire. We can just grab our pot hanger, our bush pot full of water, suspend it over the fire, wait for it to boil, and then make a nice hot cup of coffee to keep going throughout the day for the rest of our bushcraft. All right, so the water is boiling. Let's go ahead and pull it off our pot hanger. And we're gonna make a nice hot cup of coffee to get through the rest of the afternoon and into the evening. So we just got some coffee grounds. We're gonna remove the top. You see the inverted Y pot hanger. Super easy to remove the pot from the fire and then remove the lid. And then we just add coffee grounds, stir, and let it steep for a little while until it's ready. A technique is to stir the ground, and then once done stirring, we just tap the side of the bush pot or the container, whatever it is, when we're making cowboy coffee or field coffee like this. That way we loosen the grounds from the side of the container, and then once we tap the side, the grounds will begin to fall to the bottom as it cools. Once it's done cooling and it's still warm and enjoyable, we can pour that cup a nice hot cup of cowboy coffee or field coffee made with just hot water in a bush pot and some coffee grounds. Too easy.
Now, one technique we can use for bushcraft nighttime operations is creating a candlestick holder that will remain upright in the ground that we can use to illuminate camp at night during hours of limited visibility. What we do is just grab a stick off the landscape, carve a spade end or a spike into one end, flatten the top. And we take our knife and our baton, we're going to baton the top of that stick, creating a split. We gather up green bark from any of the saplings in the area, just a few inches in length, about a half inch or an inch in width, and we're going to use this to create a candlestick holder. We take that green bark, wrap it around our candle, and then fit that green bark through the split we made by batoning our knife. And then we can just fit our candle in that bark. It will stay in place, secure, and we can use matches to light this and illuminate camp at night. Well, we didn't luck out with any meat off the landscape. There were a couple opportunities, but we're just going to use our food stores that we brought out with us. The very simple meal tonight of steamed rice because we didn't luck out with any of the meat. Typically, we'll bring out the bare minimum foodstuffs to bring to the field and then supplement that diet with game harvested off the landscape. But we'll just do the rice tonight. A preferred method for preparing the rice is just to put the rice in the bowl and add water, double the water volume compared to the rice and place that entire bush pot over the fire, bring that water to a boil, let it sit on the boil for about 30 seconds to a minute and then remove from the heat, keep it close to the fire so it stays warm and allow that water to absorb into the rice and prepare the rice. One of the best meals I've ever had in my life was just a handful of rice given to me after several days of training and not having any food along with some smoked rabbit meat that I'd prepared a few days ahead of time. Put that into a canteen cup, cooked it. Best meal I've ever had. A hot meal before bed is going to increase the digestion process obviously as well as the body's heat production as part of the digestion process keeping us warm inside our shelter. We're going to avoid hot drinks or any more liquids prior to bed. That way we don't have to get up and utilize the tree line over and over again throughout the night so we can get a good night's sleep. But I'll see you guys in the morning. All right, good morning. We've been up for a little while and made a cup of coffee already to watch the sun come up. But you're caught up just in time for breakfast. Breakfast is going to be bannock today with a little bit of a twist. With our bannock, bannock is a very easy recipe to make to take out into the field because it's two or three ingredients to make bannock and we can also add other items to the bannock for whatever we desire. Now bannock is made up of flour. We brought out flour to make up the majority of that bannock bread as well as some baking powder, some sugar, and some chopped up dates. Now to make our bannock, we're gonna use our bush pot. We put in our flour, put in our baking powder, and then our sugar, and we add just a little bit of water at a time and begin stirring until we get a nice doughy ball that is not runny. Once we get that, we're gonna grab our bush pot lid and use it as a makeshift frying pan. Put that dough right on top, making sure that it doesn't go over the edges, and then we're gonna add some chopped up dates to garnish or flavor our bannock, although they look like chopped up black olives underneath the red lens. But we're gonna use this and then take it to the fire and we're just gonna lay it on the side of our fire pit close to the fire and allow that heat to slowly bake that bread and we'll come back as soon as it's ready. An added bonus to having a multi-tool as opposed to just a pocket knife or having both together is that that multi-tool gives us an extra pair of hands that we need, especially when dealing with hot material in situations that would otherwise prevent us from manipulating hot metal or hot materials while at camp. And so we can use our multi-tool here to actually pick up that bush pot lid with our bannock on top, manipulate it, and cook it over the fire easily.
Not gonna lie, this is probably one of the best bannocks I've made out in the field. I wish you guys could be here to actually taste this. The sugar obviously makes it taste excellent, but then on top of that, we have the dates that are caramelized due to the heat of the fire, and this is just an excellent breakfast to have. Those dates are on point for the nation. Highly recommend dates on top of your bannock. This is really good. All right, so we skipped over most of camp teardown. That way we could just go straight to packing our pack frame. A technique is that we just lay out that blanket, place all of our items along one side of that blanket, however we have it folded, and then simply roll the blanket with the items in toward itself and then cover with the blanket. And we can take that blanket then in this giant pack, put it right in the center of our tarp, and then just begin folding the tarp over lengthwise on top of our blanket, making it waterproof. And then we simply just dress up the ends, fold the ends over. A recommendation is folding the top of the end over first before folding it completely over the pack. That way it stays waterproof and you're less likely to have water get into our kit and get the contents wet. But this is a very easy technique that we can use also with paracord to form a diamond lash and lash it to our pack frame. All right, guys, that does it for this video. Thanks for joining me on this overnight bushcraft camp gear and the camp out out here on the prairie. I hope you like this video. If you did like this video, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, leave me a comment in the comment section. I always appreciate your feedback. I want to thank you guys for being you do for me, for this channel, for your likes, your views, your subscriptions, your comments, your feedback, and your shares. And I'll be back with another video as soon as I can, guys. Thanks.